the writer of this book? Paul the Apostle. Who is it writing to? The Corinthians. Why? They're a lot like churches today. Okay. They got lots of problems. Problemas. Mucho problemas. Lots of problems. And I'm glad that they did because we have the answers now to a lot of these problems. We have a lot of the answers because they had problems. We have uh, inspired answers to the questions. Inspired answers to the questions. Eta. Tol, Telos, Hotan, Paradido, Tain, Basileon, Tuthiu, Kai Patri, Hotan, Katar Gese, Pasan, Arcane, Kai, Pasan, Exusion, Kai, Dina Min. Then the end, Eta Totalos, then the end, whenever he hands over, actually, this is what you call a futuristic subjunctive, okay? Third person singular, present, subjunctive, active. It comes from para and didymi, okay? Whenever he may hand over, but it's futuristic, or when he shall hand over, futuristic subjunction, or subjunctive that is. Tain Basilea, the kingdom of or the kingdom to the God, even the Father, whenever he may abolish all rule and all authority and all denomen. All denomen. Now let's go to the book of Ephesians and see what he's talking about. Okay? Who wrote the book of Ephesians? All right, who's the book of Ephesians written to? Uh, a whole bunch of churches. A whole lot. That's a circular letter. It was not written to the church of Ephesians or Ephesus, but it was written and, and copied uh, by them and sent out. It became known as the Ephesian letter. All right, so this is a... We're going to go to a letter now written by the Apostle Paul again to the church at... Well, not to the church at Ephesus, but through the church at Ephesus... And it would be sent out to all the churches. And so maybe even a lot of these things pertain to us today. 2 and verse 1. And ye being dead in the... Tra I'm reading this right out of Greek, okay, if that's all right with you. Since we're teaching a Greek class, I'm just translating it out of the Greek. And uh, are yes, you being dead in the trespasses and in the sins of you, in which is then ye walked around according to the uh, to the present age, or the uh, or the times of this world, according to the ruler of the authority of the eros of the air. And of the spirit, uh, the one energizing. We're in Ephesians 2 and, and, uh, and 1 and 2. The one energizing in the sons, in the heirs of the unpersuaded ones. Apotheos. The ones that are not persuaded. Among whom also we all conducted ourselves, walked up and down, is what it says, walked up and down, then in the lust of the flesh of us, uh, doing and working out the wishes of the flesh, sarcos, okay, and of the uh, understanding, and we were technically born sons by nature of wrath just as also the rest, the ones remaining there alright, 
Now let's go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Ephesians, chapter six. We're we're in fifteen twenty four. See now, but we got to find out what fifteen twenty four talk, is talking about. A lot of people miss the ball on fifteen twenty four. So we got to find about what the authority and what what the kingdom and and uh, the power and everything there is. And then we'll go back and we'll understand it a little better. Paul the Apostle writing here again in this Ephesian letter, which is a circular letter to all the churches, and to the ones remaining, be ye empowered. Uh, dress up in the Lord and in the might of the strength of Him, and bind on the whole armor of the God, so that we'll be able to stand against the methods of the diabolical one, the methods of the diabolical one, the devil, because not it is the wrestling in coarse quarters against flesh and blood. Actually, it says against blood and flesh, but toward rulers, toward authorities, against world grabbers and uh, of the darkness, this, and spiritual forces of twisted evil in the heavenlies. He said, take up the whole armor of God in order that you may be able to stand against in that evil day. All right? In that evil day. So now let's go back and read this verse one more time. Uh, does anyone have it in the Amplified Bible, this verse? No one? Uh, I do. <clears throat> let's see if we can get it up here. 15 and verse number 24. 15, 24. If I can read it. <clears throat> After that comes the end, the completion, which he delivers over to the kingdom, to God, the Father, after rending inoperative and abolishing every other rule and every other authority and power. All right? What rules and what power? What is he going to hand over? What, what is he going to do? He's going to wrestle. And uh, in Revelation, the ninth chapter, it tells us that he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. That he's going to walk and tread out the wine press of the wrath of God. Okay? He's going to take it all over one of these days. That's what we're looking forward to, isn't it? I wish you'd do it today. 1525. Day. Gar. Auton. Vasalein. Arkri. Who. They. Ponte. Pontos. Tus, Ekthrus, Hippo, Tus, Podos, Altu. For it is bindingly necessary. That word day, there it comes from day old. Okay? Bindingly necessary. It is bindingly necessary him to reign first. Of which he may place. Look at that word right there. They. That's a little short word. They. It's a futuristic subjunctive again. Third person singular. Second aorist subjunctive active. All right. He may place all the one enemies. All the one's enemies. X throughs. Those active haters of God those active haters of God under the feet of him. Under the feet of him. Revelation, the 19th chapter. Revelation, chapter 19. Nineteen and verse uh, eleven. And I saw heaven opened up, and behold, a white horse. 
Lucos Hippos. And he who sat upon him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diademos. Diademos, diadems. What's a diadem? Remember, Cindy, you remember what a diadem is? Diademo, Stephanos, diademos. Any of you remember? What? Huh? What? Huh? A diadem is a streamer that comes off of a crown. A streamer that comes off of a crown like a ribbon it's like a extra medal of honor an extra medal of honor that comes off of a crown Alexander the Great had many streamers and each streamer represented an area that he conquered an area that he conquered Revelation 19 and verse 12 his eyes are a flame of fire and his head are many diadems all right, not 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 Stephanos, but diadems. Diadems something that you win by conquest. And he has a name written upon him, which no one knows except himself. And he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called what? Word of God. Who's the Word of God? Jesus is. The word there, ha the bar from Hebrew. That's a Hebrewism, isn't it? John is full of Hebrewism. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Jehovah God. And the armies which are in heaven, what is the other word for Jehovah the warrior? Jehovah the warrior. You remember that one? Well, the, yeah. Jehovah Savio, the Lord of Armies, Jehovah Savio. Thank you, Randall. You got an A plus for today. Jehovah Savio, the Lord of Armies. Okay? That's who it's talking about here. Jehovah Savio. We're in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 25 there, Michelle. <clears throat> and the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen. White and clean were following him on white horses. These uh, disciples of him are going to be on white horses too. I think they're not going to be there to do battle. All they're going to do is witness. And from his mouth comes out a sharp sword so that with it he may swat, smite the nations. He rule with them with a rod of iron and he treads out the wine press of the fierce wrath of God. What? Here now, what Hebrewism is he using here in, in the book of, uh, of Revelation? People that were Greek scholars would not accept the book of Revelation because it had so much bad Greek grammar in it. But it is full of Hebrewisms. And here we have another one. We talked about Jehovah Sabaoth. Now who, who do we have here? What's the other term? It's used also in uh, the book of James. Cindy, you remember? Uh, no, it's not Elohim. El Shaddai. El Shaddai. That's El Shaddai right there, the God Almighty. El Shaddai. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, Adonai Ha'adonaim in Hebrew. Another Hebrewism. King of king and Lord of lords. All right. So that's what we're talking about here in this book of 1 Corinthians, the 15, 24, and 25. 15, 25, for it is bindingly necessary to him to reign first, of which he may place all the one's enemies under the feet of him. 15, 26 now. Eskatos. Ekthros. Top. Katargete ho thanatos. Last. Look at that word, eskatos. Eskatos means last things, lastly. In other words, lastly. Enemy, he is abolished, ho thanatos. When was death abolished? When was death abolished? When was it abolished? At the cross of Calvary. Jesus Christ died. 
for our sins. He tasted death that we might not have to taste that eternal death. And when was it really, 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 when was the battle cinched? Anastasia. At the resurrection, and that's what we're talking about now. Paul's going to go into an extended dissertation on the Anastasia, on the resurrection. He's going to use all kinds of arguments proving to us and to these Corinthians there that didn't believe in the resurrection. Some of them didn't believe in the resurrection at all. He is going to prove to them that the resurrection is a fact. Without the resurrection, the gospel is worthless. You don't have any religion at all. I had a Muslim trying to witness to me the other day. And they got this so-called converted Christian who's going to speak here in a park in Bakersfield June the 6th. They don't have anything to say. That's all I can say. They don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. And I'll guarantee you that no man is going to go into heaven without Christ. So they don't get to go. <laughs> They're going to have a resurrection all right, even though they don't believe in his resurrection. They're going to have a resurrection. But it will be for eternal hell. The last enemy that is abolished, caught katargete, third person singular, present indicative passives, is death. Death, thanatos. 1527 now, 1527. Ponta, gar, het, pet, toxin, hippo, tus, hodos, autu, hotan, de, epe, Hoti, Panta, Hippo, Tetak, Te, Delon, Hoti, Ectos, Tu, Hippo, Takantos, Autu, Ta, Panta. By the way, there was a change of syntax here in Westcott and Hort and Nestle Allen. From uh, this this verse here is kind of jumbled up historically in in uh, the Greek manuscripts, but I think the most legible and the most logical syntax is the way we have it right here. I believe this is just the way Paul wrote it. They've studied this hard. A critical, what do we call a, a textual criticism? What is textual criticism? What does that mean, textual criticism? The study of the text of the New Testament. And it's called criticism, but it comes from the word in Greek, which means to crino, to judge. They took and they analyzed it scientifically and checked every manuscript and every family of manuscripts. How many of you have studied anything about the manuscripts of the Bible? Anybody? Uh, Corey, you have? Randall, you, have you you've read some things? Uh, Bruce Metzger is very good on that. He tells you about the text in the New Testament. They, there are little things in families of, of manuscripts. Uh, they'll, uh, one family of manuscripts will have a certain little two or three phrases in it. And they found out how, what year that that came into being. And they just absolutely, when the uh, Bruce Metzger writ, wrote a book called The uh, the New Testament is Corruption and Restoration. And it was definitely corrupted by intentionally sometimes and unintentionally other times. I have written the whole New Testament in Greek and I made every mistake that you could possibly make. Not on purpose. So at one time, every book in the Bible had to be copied by hand, didn't it? And can you make mistakes copying? Definitely. All right, you skip a line, whatever. Sometimes you skip a word. Even in my Hebrew, uh, I did five volumes of the book of Genesis, and we finished that Sunday night. I made mistakes in that, that we had to go back and correct. And I went over it four times. 
but sometimes you get somebody else to look at it. Randall and I was looking at we're looking at the website here a while back on John one and one, wasn't it, John? I mean, uh, John one and one yeah, or one fourteen. We left out some words, and we went through there and read it over and over again, and we put those words in there in our heads, but they weren't there. And finally, he said, "Look at this." Oh, Randall, you're really smart. You caught. <laughs> I didn't. I have to read it slow. Yeah, you have to read it real slow and let it speak to you instead of trying to read what it's supposed to say. All right. For all things he subjected, hypotoxin. Hypotasso. What does hypotasso? We've looked at that word before. Hypotasso. What does that mean? What's it literally mean? What's it literally mean? Anybody remember? Cindy, you remember that one? Randall, you remember that one? You don't forget anything. Under row. Under row. Uh, Randall was in the army. Now, you were in the army. Did you? Th now, uh, you were under rowers. Everybody has a place in the army, don't they? At, at Randall's house, he has a whole lot of insignias. Uh, uh, what, how they start out as a general and go down to privates, okay? And everybody that is above somebody else, they have to treat them with great respect and reverence and honor, okay? Respect, reverence, and honor. You have to look up. Brother Roger, you were captain. Captain Roger. Yeah. There's a lot of people had to look up to you, didn't they? <laughs> but you had to look up to others, didn't you? Above you. That's what this term says is to set in order, to set in a military order. What's he going to do? Who's going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ for all eternity? Who's going to rule and reign with it? With it? Well, who is going to who rule and reign with him forever? His church. His wife. She's very close to him. You have a chance to be in that little bride today. You have a chance to be in that close relationship with God today. Later on, it's going to be too late. <laughs> too late. For all things he subjected under the feet of him. Uh, moreover, whenever he may say that all things it has been subjected, it is clear, Dalon, it is clear that apart from hectos, hectos, apart from the one having subjected to him the all things or the things all. Christ will finally triumph over all things and all spiritual forces. What are those things that he's going to... What are those things he's going to triumph over? Let's put them in order here. What are the things that he's going to triumph over? Anybody know? Let's list them. What are the things? Ephesians what, Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 6. What are those things? We wrestle not against blood and flesh, but against what? All right. Powers. Powers and authorities. And uh, world rulers, I guarantee you, there will not be one crooked politician left alive on this earth after the Lord takes care of it. All right? Who are behind the politicians today? You want to know why they're bad? You've got very, very slim chance of one being good out there. They're all on the dole. <laughs> okay. 
That's as simple as that. Powers, authorities, and world rulers, literally what it means is world grabbers. World grabbers. World grabbers. Now, these are the high forces. Who is the number one man here? Who is he? Diabolos. The diabolical one. The devil's up there on the top, isn't he? And who's under him? Other high angels. High angelic orders. Okay. High angelic orders. Are you guys getting cold? Some of you know. You, are you Cindy? Are you? No? Okay. Because you're underneath the thing back there somewhere. High angelic orders. And then what else? Spiritual. There are spiritual beings. Who are they? The fallen spirits. Fallen spirits. Now let's get down to the physical propagation of this. Physical. All right? Physical. The physical things. Who are the physical? Who are the physical that are going to be on the earth. We're going to have one giant powerful Nephilim. What is his name? What's that tremendous Nephilim that's going to be on the earth in the last days? Huh? The Antichrist. You got an A plus, see? The Antichrist. He's going to be a Nephilim. What is a Nephilim? Nephilim comes from Nephale. What does that mean? Fallen ones. In, Gen in Genesis, the sixth chapter, and verses 1 through 4 or 5 there, we talk about the Nephilim, the fallen ones. That's when angels went down and cohabited with women. How many of you ever heard of Rosemary's Baby, the movie? That was basically a movie about the devil cohabiting with a woman and bringing forth a bad child. How about the, uh, the movie Damien and uh, all of those uh, movies, the whole bunch of them? This is... You know, they're playing games up there with all this sci-fi stuff, but I'm going to tell you something. It's real. It's real. It's going to really happen. Who was uh, Goliath and his five brothers, four brothers? They were giants. They were Nephilim. They were falling ones, fallen ones. We studied them in the book of Genesis. We chased rabbits after them several different times. When David went to that brook, he picked up how many stones? Five stones. What was he going to do with those five stones? Kill five Nephilim. One of them came after him. One, giant, one, one head Nephilim came out there, and that was Goliath. Okay? And Goliath didn't last long, and they all took off running. But the, 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 the armies of Israel chased them for years, didn't they? One Nephilim almost killed David. And he had to be saved by his men, by Jonathan, actually. And what did they tell David after that? You can't go out to war anymore. You're too valuable to us. We're going to send the men after these beings. All right? After these beings. Well, there's going to be some of them on the earth. One special one, he's, he's the Antichrist. Okay? And then those others that are just following, those that were not persuaded by God. So these are all the forces that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to bring into order, and he's going to do it. He's going to do a whole lot better job of it than David did, or Jonathan, or even Samson. Okay? 15.28. We've gotten some syntax here now. <coughs> Hotan, De, Hippotage, Alto, Ta, Panta, Tot. Kai is in parenthesis there in brackets, but we'll just say it anyway. It's understood. Altos, Hohios, Hippotage, Sete. To, 
hypotoxante, auto, ta, panta, hina, a, ho, theos, ta, panta, n, pasin. Little old weak adversive conjunctive particle there, that's day. That's how it starts out. Moreover, or but, whenever it may be subjected, look at that futuristic aorist there. See that? See that subjunctive mode? This is what you call a futuristic aorist. It's going to happen. We know that. But whenever it happens, Paul didn't know when it was going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. I wish it would happen pretty soon. It would be nice, wouldn't it? But whenever it is subjected to him all things, then also himself, the Son, he shall be subjected to the one having subjected to him all things in all. In order that may be the God, the things all and in all, God shall be one, and we all shall be one with him. That's the fi final result. That's the final result. Whenever it is subjected, it shall be subjected. Third person singular, second aorist, subjunctive, passive. Each and everything, by the way. It didn't say, that's not plural, that's each thing. Each order that we just talked about. When every one of these orders are finally taken care of, Then also himself, the Son, he shall be subjected to the one having subjected to him all things. In order that may be, look at that word may be there. Third person singular, present, subjunctive, active, may be the God all in all things. All in all things. Let's read. Uh, 15, uh, we read. Twenty-five. I think we read twenty-four. Didn't we read that? We didn't read twenty-five, did we? Michelle, do you want to come up here and read this for me? <clears throat> Fifteen, uh, twenty-five through twenty-eight. Fifteen, twenty-five through twenty-eight. Right there, down that way. For Christ must be the king and reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be subdued and abolished in death is death. For he, the Father, has put all things in subjection under his, which is Christ's feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection under him, it is evident that he himself is expected who does the subjecting of all things to him. However, when everything is subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subject himself to the Father who put all things under him, so that God may be all in all, that is, be everything to every one supreme the indwelling and controlling factor of life. Thank you. Right now, what is the indwelling and controlling factor of all the lives of the world? Even God's children, we have problems with ourselves, don't we? We do. We got problems with the sarks. We don't, we don't we? We have problems with the flesh. It fights against us all the time. But, boy, won't it be nice if we can just lay all of that down? No more confusion, no more problems. 1529. 1529. Epe. T. Hoi a Susan. Hoi. Baptizo Minoi. Hiper. Tom Necron. A. Holos. Necroi. Uk. Ege Ronte. T, Kai, Baptizonte, Hiper, Alton, 
Paul the Apostle now is, brings up a whole different argument. He, uh, why are you baptized? Why are we baptized today? We're not baptized to be saved, are we? We're, we're baptized because we have been saved, all right? You're baptized because you have been saved. We're baptized because we have believed in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. We have. We have done that. And we're baptized to bind on him so we'll be identified with him in the world. We tie up, we tie on his clothing when we're baptized. We die to our old fleshly nature and we're raised anew to walk in Christ. Christ died... Okay? Did he stay dead? Wouldn't have done us any good if he stayed dead. Joe would just have him staying dead forever. Never was raised, they said. They don't know what happened to his body. Well, after resurrection, there is nothing. There is no hope. We just may as well go out and live like a dog. A cat or a bird. Doesn't matter. That's what Paul's going to say. That's what he's going to say. What, a little uh, interrogative pronominal adjective, what, otherwise, they shall do. The ones baptizing. The ones what? What does that word, should that word be there? What should that word be? There's three words you need to memorize here. Baptizo, nipto, and rontizo. Okay. What does nipto mean? Pour. What does rontizo mean? Sprinkle. What does baptizo mean? What's the Latin equivalent of baptizo? The Latin equivalent. The Latin equivalent. Looks just like English. Mergio. We get our word immerse out of that, okay? Now let's look and see what baptism is. Baptism is a picture of something in it. Baptism is a picture of something. When you scripturally or literally baptize, immerse somebody, what are you doing? You're laying them into a watery grave, aren't you? On Monday, I went down to the necropolis. I went to the necropolis up on Panama, and I went to the necropolis downtown, and over on on the on the south side of Vectorfield, necropolis, the city of the dead. The city of the dead. Those people that live there, the bodies live there. They're not there, just the bodies. Okay, they're dead, and they're laid in their their bodies are in the grave still under the ground or in crypts or whatever, okay? And uh, we're baptized according to Christ's death. We're dipped, immersed according to Christ's, Christ's death. We're dipped in the water, and we're not left there. If you left in the water, what happens? You're drowned. You don't breathe water very well. How many of you have been got inundated with water a couple of times and got choked up spitting water. Didn't work. You can't stay down there. Christ didn't stay in the grave. You're, you're baptized, you're dipped in the watery grave and you're raised according to his resurrection. And Paul is starting to say now if there is no resurrection the whole 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is about the resurrection. He tells us what the gospel is. He tells us what the gospel is. That, can you see it now? Huh? Oh. Mergio, Rontizo, Nipto, and Baptizo. Okay? He tells us what the gospel was. The gospel is that Christ came according to the scriptures, that he died according to the scriptures, that he was buried according to the scriptures, and that he was raised according to the scriptures. And without any one of those factors, there is no gospel. Now he's going to tell us 
Why in the world are you baptizing somebody? Now, there are 30 different interpretations of this verse right here. Did you know that? Cindy, have you read a bunch of these interpretations of this? The Mormons come off on this one. This is why they baptize people for the dead. Did you know that? In other words, if you got somebody a thousand years ago in your family, they really check their genealogy, don't they? And every one of those, you know that I've been baptized by proxy in the Mormon church. Half of my family are Mormons. Did you know that? Have you, You've been baptized too. You just didn't know it. You've been baptized in, in the Mormon church. You sure have by proxy. The other part of our, the Mormon side of our family baptized each one of us. They were baptized by proxy, each one of us. They baptize you for the remission of sins so you get to go into some sort of heaven. Okay? And that's what they, how they interpret this scripture, but that's not what this scripture is talking about. The subject here is why, if Jesus Christ didn't raise from the dead, why in the world are we, when we're baptized, why don't we just leave her, the person there on the water? That would be the thing to do if he, did, if he wasn't raised. Why don't you just leave them down there? You do raise them up, don't you? You don't leave them there. I remember about 10 years ago, I had a student in my class, and she was afraid of water. And I had gone down to uh, Los Angeles, and I had uh, radical prostatectomy surgery, and that's where they gut you and put you back together. And I had about 30-some-odd of my Sunday school students that wanted me to baptize them. And we went to the church over there, and they asked me, kept asking me, do you think that you're strong enough to baptize us? And I finally said, yeah, I think so. I think I can do it. You know, because it was, takes a long time for you to grow back together, you know. So I went down in the baptistry, and boy, they were just coming in. The, when they went forward for baptism, the whole, uh, on that side of the building up there, the whole balcony, the stairs was just filled with them like that coming down there, a whole bunch of them. Anyway, I was in there baptizing one after another. This one woman in my class was afraid of water. And I believe in baptizing somebody. How many have you been to a graveyard lately? Did anybody see any hands sticking up or foot or anything, head sticking out of, out of the dirt? No, that's not what you want to see. Well, when I baptize somebody, I put them under the ground under the water and this girl tried to stick her hand up and I took her to the bottom of the baptistry and I went down there with her Whing! way down there I was all wet and she was all wet but she was down under the, the water she went under because it was a picture of a burial and I wasn't going to leave her hand up or her foot up or anything else I brought her down to the bottom filled up my waders <laughs> real good all of that and baptized the microphone <laughs> and everything it went out but it, she got baptized she got immersed <clears throat> what shall we do the ones baptizing on behalf of the dead ones okay if actually the dead ones not they are raised look at that one they are raised. Third person plural, present, indicative, middle voice. By the way, what raises you from the dead? What raises you from the dead? Tell me what raises you from the dead. What earmarks you for the resurrection? What raises you from the dead? What is in you that causes you to be raised from the dead? We're trying you. What was that? The Spirit of God. We're branded with the Spirit of God. The old spirit is X'd out and we're taking the Spirit of God and that brands us and earmarks us and it's in us forever. We're body and we're soul and we're spirit. That spirit is placed in the person as a deposit. In Ephesians, the first chapter, it tells us that we have a non-refundable deposit of the Holy Spirit in us a non-refundable deposit. 
once you've been really saved, you are saved forever. That's beautiful. If you could lose your salvation, there wouldn't be any God because God would be gone. Part of you, you are indelibly mixed with him when you are born again. Indelibly mixed with him. <clears throat> they are raised. Why indeed are they baptized on behalf of them? All right. Now, in history, we had more of the problems back in the old days than just the Mormons today, baptizing for the dead. Tertullian said in volume three of the Antonician Fathers on page 449, I looked this up, see. He said that there was a heretical group way back yonder that started baptizing people for dead people, just like the Mormons do today. So it didn't happen. There are 30 different interpretations of this. Paul did not condone by any means what the Mormons practice today in this verse. Because that's not what he's talking about, is it? Okay, 1530. 1530. T. Chi. Himes. Keen D. Neumann. Pason. Horon. All right. Why also we, why are also, why we, we are in peril, danger, jeopardy every hour. Paul the Apostle says that he was in jeopardy, in danger every hour. In danger all the time from the time that he was walking on the road to Damascus until he made his last trip to Rome. Paul the Apostle was in constant peril and danger, was he not? Why was he in danger? When Paul stood up on Mars Hill and preached about Jesus and Asus and Chi Anastasia, what was he saying? Jesus and the resurrection. They thought that he was talking about a princess. Every god had a, had a mistress or a wife. And they thought they were talking about Jesus and his mistress or his wife called Anastasia. But when he told them about the resurrection from the dead, what did they do? They were, they were going to kill him. They told him he's a total, absolute heretic. Because of the resurrection, because of the preaching of the gospel, and, and the resurrection is an inseparable part of the gospel. It is an inseparable part of the gospel because of the resurrection. Paul was in constant peril and danger all of his life until it finally cost him his life. What caused Peter to get killed? Peter was crucified upside down, wasn't he? According to history, what caused him to be baptized or to be crucified upside down? Baptism and the resurrection. When you baptize somebody and they became a member of a church, their life was in jeopardy. The Roman Empire was going to make Christianity a capital offense. Judaism had already made it a capital offense, hadn't they? Right off the bat, Judaism made baptism and the preaching of the, re the resurrection. And who do we have one of the first martyrs in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts? Who do we have there? Who was it? Stephen. Who was the, the court what we call the sergeant of arms of the Sanhedrin court. Who was he? He was on the scene. Who was the man? Saul, which became Paul. And he told them to cast the first stone. He probably cast the first stone. He was there holding their clothing as they were killing Stephen. And by the way, that was a totally illegal court hearing. They couldn't do that.
Those who received baptism would also tie on this death sentence with them. In Ephesus, Paul was uh, abused a lot, and we're going to find out a little bit about it here in a few minutes. Paul was imprisoned. There is a prison there called Paul's Prison in Ephesus. Uh, not only was he imprisoned, uh, but I will we'll get to it. Let's get there. Koth, Hemiron, Apothenesco, Ne. Tain, Hemateron, Cox, A. Sin, Adelphoi is in parenthesis there, Hain, Echo, N. Christo, Asu, Tu, Curio. Got it? Did I do it all? What? Did I miss something? Oh, he meant. He moaned. I missed he moaned. Thank you. I'm blind in one eye now, <laughs> almost. <laughs> I see pretty good out of the other one, but I missed it. According to the day I die, look at that word nay there. Have you ever seen that word nay any place else in the Bible? You're not going to see it in the New Testament because it's the only place you're ever going to see it. Nay is a very unusual Attic used with the accusative. It is used in the affirmation of oaths, solemn oaths, oaths that deal with life and death. When you go into court, you're supposed to make, you put your hand on the Bible and you swear to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's what they say. I found out some of them lie. But that's what you call a solemn oath. And this is the term that you use, the solemn oath that you use. In 2 Corinthians 1 and 18 and 23 and 11 and verse 10 and 31 and Romans 9 and 1, you see and you hear about Paul telling us about solemn oaths. Solemn oaths. Swear allegiance. When you go in the army, did you swear an oath? That's a solemn oath, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. You had to put your hand up and swear a solemn oath. What did you say, Brother Randall? That was a lot of years ago. I don't remember. Do you remember, right, Captain uh, Roger, do you remember what you said? Mm -hmm. yeah. If it was a solemn oath to defend the United States with your life. Life. When we tie on Christ, that's a solemn oath, people. Did you know that? That's a solemn oath. It's a solemn oath when we put on Christ. This is used in the Septuagint in Genesis 42 and 15. Genesis 42 and 15 in the Septuagint. Septuagint is what? What's the Septuagint? Anybody know what the Septuagint is? That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament. Okay. In Genesis 42 and 15, we see this word ne there, Solomon. Oath. Okay, let's go back and look at that for just a moment. 42, uh, 15, Genesis 42, 15. If I can find it in my Bible, Genesis 42, 15. <clears throat> Do you have that verse? All right, here Joseph is talking to his brothers. Joseph is talking to his brothers, and he was running them through the ringer very harshly, really scrutinizing and judging them according to their, who they are. <laughs> he knew everything about them, didn't he? And uh, Joseph said to them in verse 14, It is I... It is as I say to you, you are spies. And by this, you will be tested by the life of Pharaoh. This is what we call a solemn oath. 
by the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Okay? Unless your youngest brother. Send one of you that he may get to your brother while you remain confined that your words may be tested by Solomon whether there it is truth in you. See that word truth there? In you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. Surely you are spies. That's the word of Solomon oath right there. That's where it's used. Page uh, 277 in an analytical Greek lexicon, by the way. I, uh, according to the day I die, by the solemn oath of your boasting brothers, which I have in Christ Jesus in the Lord of us. Okay? Paul protested by saying that he was glorying in you. No, there's no word for protest there. Paul was under the sentence of death, and daily he was under the sentence of death because of his stand for Christ, and he said, so are you guys. So are you. So are you. 32. A. Kata. Anthropon. Eth they re o mox ase. Asa. In Epheso, T moi, to a philos, a necroi, uk egeronte, fagomen, kai, piomen, orion, gar, apotheneskomen. All right, now here we have a first-class conditional particle, that A in the front of it. It's going to change as we go. According to man, I fought with wild beasts. Look at that word. That, the word therion there, therion, it's on page 195 if you want to look it up in the, in the analytic Greek lexicon, that word therion. Therion and makesa. Makesa, it, the makesa means a sword. I fought with wild beasts. Now, there are two interpretations of this. Some people say because Paul was a Roman citizen, he wasn't going to be thrown in with the lions and the tigers. But Paul, by inspiration, told us this, didn't he? Now, did Paul ever get beaten? Did he ever get flogged? Was he ever stoned to death? Now, you couldn't do that to, to, to a Roman citizen without appealing to Rome could you? But did it happen to him? Okay. Do you think maybe that he might have been thrown in a lion's den? Just possibly in Ephesus? Do you think that he might have been thrown out there with tigers and lions in a coliseum in, in Ephesus? Do you think that was possible since he'd been stoned to death, since he had all these other things done to him, and he, still he was a Roman citizen? Do you think that he might have been thrown in a coliseum with lions or tigers or leopards? He said, I fought with wild beasts. Now, some people say, well, he's talking about the people there, that they were like wild beasts. But that's not what Paul says. Is first person singular, first there's indicative active. That I fought with wild beasts with a sword. Now, whether it's figurative or literal, I would take it. I'm a literalist, you know that? How many of you are literalists? When the Bible says something, I believe it. <laughs> as simple as that. I believe it. Especially from the original language. I fought with wild beasts in Ephesus. And he tells you where. What to me? The prophet. The wages. Since dead ones, not they are raised... Third person plural, present subjunctive, middle. Again, every time it talks about the resurrection, it's talking about that branding mark on you. How many of you branded for the resurrection? You like that? Branded for the resurrection. Branded for the resurrection.
the dead ones, not they are raised. May we eat and may we drink, and tomorrow for we shall die. Now, the Apostle Paul is quoting a pagan poet. Did you know that? In Isaiah 22, 13, they quoted a pagan poet. Not everything that you read in the Bible is, if you're reading the book of Job, not every part, not every line and every phrase and every scripture in Job is inspired. Did you know that? Some of it's history. And what I mean by that? Job's friends, I've heard preachers preach from the, from the words from Job's friends which God castigated later and they think that's inspired and they'll go and, and build them a sermon out of it. That's what we call by, doing violence to the scriptures. When the devil says something, is it always right? No. So you have to be careful how you, vote, how you subdivide and how you divide scriptures. In the Dictionary of Phase and Fable, printed in 1894 by uh, a man by the name of Brewer, E. Colum Cobham Brewer. It said the Egyptians in their ancient banquets exhibited a skeleton to their guests when they came in the door. That sounds pretty gross, doesn't it? They did this. They did this in all these fancy banquets in Egypt. They'd have a skeleton there, and they would exhibit. You know, besides that, Egypt is a place of graveyards. It's a great, great big graveyard. Anyway, I mean, they had all kinds of mummies all over Egypt. That was one period of time in history uh, after they started discovering some of those mummies over there uh, that they started shipping them into France and to England and Germany and all over. And everybody that had anybody that, that was anybody had a mummy in their parlor. Really, they did. They all had one of these mummies to show off. And one of the ways that they would greet their guest is say, to remind them of the brevity of the human life, saying, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. All right? For the tomorrow we die. This was a pagan poet. And the pagan poet's name was Erastus. Erastus. Okay. In Ephesus, what to me it profits? Since the dead ones, not they are raised. He said, I'm going to act like these Epicureans now. If the dead ones don't raise, if there is no resurrection, let's just have a ball. Let's just have one orgy after another and just, just live like dogs and cats and horses and pigs. If there's no resurrection, so what? May we do just like they did in Egypt and display a skeleton. And when you come into my banquet here, eat and drink and be merry because you may be a skeleton before you get out of here. You may turn into jerky. You know, they'll dehydrate you and mummify you. For tomorrow we die. Well, we will finish there for tonight. And we went from uh, 1524 <coughs> through 32. We'll start there next week if the Lord spares my life. Pray for me tomorrow. I have to go have a treadmill test. See if I can make it through that. My veins have lost their elasticity because of the mercury and arsenic. And uh, what a mess. <laughs> All I can say is it's really fun. <laughs> I'm having a ball lick <laughs> with my poor health. <laughs> anyway. Well... Let's have a prayer, go out and do something eternal. Cindy, do you feel like coming up here and dismissing all? Corey, you're the only soldier left that I can get up here. <coughs> Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to come learn your word. 
Lord, may we go out and be good examples. And Lord, may we face each day in a manner that glorifies you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.